Okay, so we are we are recording. So um, uh, I put in the link to both the slides and the tutorial uh, on the chat. If you go on that um, web page, there is a link post to the to this slides in PDF format and also uh, the, the the tutorial that we are going to run. Um, so this work is joined with uh, several people. Uh, some students that work with uh, me and Vinit Bafna in the computer science department here at UCSD and Tom Wilbert and Christian Bohman in the um, uh, University of uh, Copenhagen in, in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, the students are Shahab Metin, Nora Shahab uh, Metin is joining us uh, for the tutorial to help with the questions. So what I want to talk about today, a lot of it is sort of captured in this sort of news and views piece that we just uh, very recently published in Molecular Ecology, basically making the argument that genome skimming uh, has the potential to uh, uh, advance uh, and sort of, I don't want to say replace, but augment what we can do with uh, traditional barcoding. And so that's what uh, I'm going to, do. everything that I'm going to talk about is sort of um, the overview is in this paper and, uh, and everything is related to this theme. Okay, so sample identification, you guys know better than I do, you know, it's very essential for many biological questions. You have a sample, you don't know what a species it is, or you don't know what, uh, you know, population within a species it is, and you want to identify what exactly you have, what a species, what sub uh, species. Um, it's important, I don't have to tell you what this is important for is, you know, if you want to study biodiversity, if you want to uh, figure out the source of uh, food that you're eating and make sure it's not um, uh, uh, fake, if you want to uh, trace, um, uh, trace the origin of uh, uh, your traded material that might be uh, illegally traded, all of those, um, can um, uh, can benefit from uh, ab the ability to do quick and cheap sample identification. Uh, with uh, you know, some identification manually is difficult. Uh, the main alternative uh, is either uh, molecular or more recently there are things like image analysis. These are more recent stuff that uh, that I'm not going to talk about, but those are also exist as as alternatives. Um, okay, so the molecular approach that has been here, uh, used for decades now has been barcoding. That's what many of you guys are familiar with. You have some sample, you take the DNA from a very small region of the genome. Uh, it's barcode, so it could be, for example, the CO1 gene. Um, and uh, you sequence only that region uh, and, and use that as a barcode to uh, identify your sample. Uh, what's good about the traditional barcoding using uh, things like C1 gene is that it is cheap um, uh, and uh, it's very cheap and it's, uh, you know, th these genes are selected carefully so that, you know, they are uh, varied enough so that you can hopefully distinguish the species. But no matter how carefully you choose a gene of, let's say, uh, a thousand base pairs or so, um, they are still short. They still have limit. They still give you limited resolution. So there are many papers out there that talk about you know limitations of barcoding in terms of, uh, for example, if you want to distinguish the species within the same uh, genus, a lot of time that fails. Uh, they are basically identical, and and so you just have limited resolution. And if you want to do within a species, then th that really is just is not super powerful for for many um, organisms. Uh, the alternative that presents itself, of course, is whole genome sequencing, which, which these days is supposed to be cheap. Can we do that? Can we sequence the entire genome, not of bacteria or viruses, of like a, a carrier species, to, to, to identify its um, uh, 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 origin? Uh, you know, it's, everyone tells you about, you know, how sequencing cost is going down, that's true, but it's still assembling this, uh, you know, uh, genomes, even draft genomes is not super easy, right? So, you know, the, these data, of course, uh, are a little bit outdated at this point, but the number of assembled genomes compared to the number of known species and predicted species is very low. 
And also, uh, so, so for, for the foreseeable future, we are in this regime where there are many representative genomes assembled, but a lot of the species do not have a, a, an assembled genome. It, it's not as trivial as, as it sounds to, 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 to assemble the genomes, even with low sequencing cost. Okay, so what's the genome skimming alternative? You can take your sample, you can shotgun sequence it at very low covers, let's say one or two. Uh, I, I wrote one or two gigabyte, uh, gigabase pairs here. Maybe a better way to say it is one or two X coverage of the genome, depending on what genome you have. You can do this, uh, do this, this, this for, uh, for very little money by, by multiplexing many samples together in one run. Um, so you could, for less than $50, you can, you can do this. And, and so the genome skimming idea has been around for a while. The proponents of genome skimming, they envisioned it this way. Once you have the genome skim, because the organic genome is overrepresented tremendously in your sample, you know, by, by orders of magnitude, even if your coverage of the entire genome is 1 to X, you have enough coverage to assemble the organic genome. And the organic genome is, is, is not a small, right? It, it gives you more information than one, uh, let's say, uh, uh, CO1 gene. So that's how it has been envisioned uh, originally. But, uh, and people are building various databases of uh, reference databases, sort of equivalent of bold uh, for barcodes for this kind of analysis. Uh, the problem, of course, is that even here, you are throwing away the vast majority of the data, which is from the nuclear uh, genome, um, it's true that the organic genome is overrepresented, it still is a tiny fraction of all your beads. Um, and, and that just looks wasteful, and, and organic genomes usually are just like one gene tree out of your, um, uh, it, 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 there is, there's that issue as well. So for, seven, for various reasons, you want to really look at nuclear genome if you can, but if your coverage is low and you can't assemble the, the genome, uh, what can you do? Well, maybe you can map your risk to a reference genome if you have one that is close enough. But if the way you are doing your, so if, let, let's think about landscape genomics, right? Where you go to a place, you set a trap, you get a lot of insects and you want to just skim all of them and detect what's in there. The, uh, the chances are you do not have a reference genome that, uh, of the exact species. So mapping to a reference genome is also not going to be enough. So what can you do? Well, uh, you know, the way we think about it is that we should just think about uh, the bag of leads that we have. When we say bag of leads, basically we mean your SRA file. Think of this bag of leads, the SRA file that you have, as the barcode of your genome. That is your barcode. If that is the barcode, then essentially what we need to be able to answer to be, to be able to do sample identification is the following question. Given two bags of reads, what's the distance between the genomes that produce those bags of reads? Um, and we want to be able to answer this with low covers, let's say with one X, a little bit less, a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Now, what do I mean by distance? You know, there are various ways to de uh, define it. I will go with the simplest definition. If we did have the entire genomes assembled, and if we had a perfect alignment of those two genomes, what would be the percentage of uh, positions where they differ? So the Hamming distance. That's, uh, that's what, uh, so whenever I say distance today, uh, unless I say otherwise, I'm talking about Hamming distance. Uh, okay, so how do we go about doing this? I'm going to go very fast over the methodological parts. I'll skip most of it. The slides are there if you are more interested. So we're going to take a KMER based approach. You take a read, you divide it into KMERs. If you have two genome schemes now, they are going to, the KMERs that fall on the positions that are different are going to be different. All the other KMERs are the same. So that's the signal that we are going to use. If you are uh, familiar with the tool MASH, uh, that's where we sort of started to borrowing the ideas from. You can uh, think about the set of KMERs in one genome, the set of KMERs in the other genome. You can think about the Jacquard index between these two sets. The Jacquard is just the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union. Uh, the higher it is, the more similar to things they are. 
this Jacquard uh, index between two sets of k-mers can be computed very, very uh, quickly using a min hash technique that uh, the MASH tool has as part of here. So that, that, that problem is already solved. How do you compute the Jacquard? Once you have Jacquard, people had already also figured out, uh, you know, including the MASH and earlier papers, the, how do you translate the Jacquard index, J, to this Hamming distance? The, the computations here are, I, I don't have to go through them. If you uh, sit down and go through them a little bit more carefully, this is, there is not, this is not rocket science. This is pretty uh, the easiest stuff. But at the end, all you need to know is there is an equation where you can plug in the Jacquard index and K, the size of the K-mer, the length of these substrings that we are looking at, and get an estimate of your uh, distance. The question is how good is this distance? This, this calculation has in it a lot of assumptions built in, which I didn't uh, mention, but, uh, but let's just look empirically how good it is. So we took some genome uh, and we changed, we added mutation to it randomly at 5% across the genome. We did a genome scheme with 16X coverage and we just ran match and computed the distance from the Jacquard and the accuracy was pretty good. The problem is, uh, oops, the problem is when you reduce the coverage, we are going to overestimate the distance dramatically, right? So it's not so good for low coverage. The reason is that you know, uh, the Jacquard is, if you have high coverage, the Jacquard is only a function of where you have mutations. Where you have the mutations, your k are gonna be different else, everywhere else, they're gonna be the same. When you, have low coverage, that's not the case. If some part of the genome is not covered by uh, reads uh, from both of the uh, genomes, those parts are going to uh, reduce the Jacquard index because they are not part of the intersection, not just be not because there is a mutation, but because it's not covered, right? So the coverage has to be modeled. Similarly, if you have sequencing error, you have the same problem. If you have only one read and that read has an error, that k error is not shared, but that's not a real mutation, that's a sequencing error. So what do we do? Uh, or a solution, which is this method called a skimmer, is based on this idea. If uh, you give me the Jacquard, and if you tell me what the coverage and sequencing error sort of level is, then I can come up very easily with an update to that equation. What that, you know, the details of this equation doesn't matter. All, it, all, all that matters here is that this is an updated version of that equation where you can go from the Jacquard and these parameters that are uh, sort of uh, related to coverage and sequencing error to distance D, right? Okay, so now all I have to be able to do is estimate coverage and estimate uh, sequencing error. I plug them in this equation and I get an estimate of uh, distance from the Jacquard. Okay, how do I estimate coverage? Traditionally, what you do is you look at how many times you see a K-mer. Uh, if you see a, a histogram like this, you know your coverage is 10 minutes. This approach is not gonna work if your coverage is low, one X or something, because, because at that point, this sort of Poisson distribution don't have a mole. But, but that's, a that's a problem that does have a solution. We came up with, uh, with a solution. I, I don't, again, I'm going to sort of jump over the details of that solution. It's still looking at this histogram, but not looking at the mode of this histogram, doing a somewhat more complex analysis. Okay, so at the end, the pipeline is this. You have your bag of feet. Before you can do anything, uh, so, uh, uh, Okay, so so that you know so that's what uh, this method is skimmer is right so uh, let me let me let me tell you what the pipeline is you have your bag of reads you do it through sort of normal cleaning of of these reads you can for example use uh, DB tools uh, you know, to get rid of the duplicates and things like that. Uh, there is the issue of contamination. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. You have to be able to filter contamin contaminants. That's the step where uh, basically present, uh, right now, I think this is the place where we need the most um, advances. I don't, I'm not going to claim we have final solutions here. This, this is the remains challenging, but you could, uh, along with the start is using tools like Kraken to search against a reference library of possible contaminants. Once you do that, you have a still a, a bag of reads. 
you run this through a skimmer and a skimmer does two things. It uh, estimates coverage and uh, uh, genome length and sequencing error, all of those using these sort of histograms of how many times you see a KMER. And once it has that, it hashes and uh, sketches the, these uh, genomes. These uh, sketches are basically these small representations of your genome scheme that allow you to compute the JACARD index. This is what MASH can uh, do for you. And with these two things computed, you can compute the distance between two genomes. So let's say you have computed these, these two things for a set of reference genomes or genome schemes. These could be genome schemes for which you know the identity. So the ones that are called reference, you know exactly which species it is already. And now you have a query. So for the reference, for the query, for all of them, you have gone through this process on top. And now what you can do is compare the query to each of these references and compute the Hamming uh, distance using the method SQM. Um, and we are going to look at how this works during the tutorial. Okay, so how does it work on, on the simulation data I was showing you earlier? So this is what MASH would give you as, as we saw earlier when the coverage goes down the accuracy of MASH goes down. The red bar here is the true distance, and, and the blue ones is what MASH would, uh, would estimate. Um, with a skimmer, that problem uh, is, uh, is largely solved. In other words, no matter what coverage you have, this is one over eight X coverage, right? It's still, you get very, uh, pretty good estimates of distance. At very high distances, it starts to be underestimated a little bit, uh, but, um, and, and that's not because of low coverage, it's because of, um, you know, other issues that have to do with the assumptions we made for going from Jakarta to distance. But, but it's a decent estimate of the, of the distance, um, at least up to something like 20% distance. These are simulations where we have added mutations at uh, specific levels at random, so the, these follow our assumptions perfectly. What if you look at pairs of real genomes? These are pairs of uh, real bird genomes. Some of them are very close to each other, two, two eagles, um, for example, here. Some of them are quite far away from one another. Uh, in all cases, if you do low coverage, if you go to low coverage, um, uh, let's say 1x, uh, with, with MASH, you get very poor estimates of distance. With the skimmer, you, would, uh, you get good uh, estimates. Uh, we, we can look at this on various data. You could look at the you know, pairs of Drosophila, it's the same thing. Like uh, over here, these are the skimmer pairs of distances. They are pretty accurate for MASH, it's not. There is another method called AAF, which was also des designed for dealing with low coverage. Uh, a lot of sort of ideas uh, for how to go from Hamming distance to Jacquard was already developed in this method. But unfortunately, it's correction. So the uncorrected is uh, doesn't correct for coverage. Corrected version does, but it doesn't improve the accuracy of the distance as much. Um, these are uh, so these were uh, on simulated genome schemes. So we took the assembly and we simulated the schemes from it uh, using uh, this tool uh, called ART. These are the results when we start from the SRA falls, um, and, uh, and still we see the same thing. The, the accuracy is pretty good. So just by comparing the SRA falls, we can compute their distances pretty uh, accurately. Uh, the, the coverage here is about half X. So what does this translate to in terms of um, sample identification? So in this analysis, we are doing leave one out. So we have 48, uh, bird genomes will leave, uh, so it's not leave one out, leave a bunch out. We leave out all the genes, so we take a query, uh, we, we choose one of them as query, we leave out of the database anything that is 1% uh, distant to it or closer, or 2% or 3% and, and so forth, right? So everything that is very similar to it will leave out. Because if you have an exact match, uh, you're going to be able to find it, right? If you don't have an exact match, can you find the closest thing available in the reference database? And, and in this case, it, uh, uh, you know, if Kimmer finds this closer match very accurately, whereas MASH and AF uh, do not. And just to be clear, MASH is not designed for this kind of data. So this is not uh, 
you know, they had never claimed that it would uh, work, but, but we had to show that, you know, we started to compare this up. Um, okay, so the tool is Skimmer is available online. We're gonna look at uh, uh, its usage. The, the paper was published in 2019 uh, in biology, and you can, you can read it for technical details. Okay, now uh, let me uh, have another, I think, nine minutes. So um, let me talk about the phylogenetics uh, using these distances, right? So this is a phylogeny of Anopheles using CO1 marker. All the red branches are those that conflict with open theory of life reference phylogeny. There's a lot of conflict. That's not a surprise. A gene tree is not the same as the species tree. What if we just take the skimmer distances, these Hamming distances, and correct them phylogenetically using the simplest method possible, which is Duke's counter model 69, and, and then build a phylogeny using fast ME, the distance, you know, one of the best distance-based methods that exists out there, and, uh, and use that as our, uh, as our phylogeny. We have only one branch here that is wrong. So it, um, you know, so this, this has made us uh, sort of positive that you can start to do some level of phylogenetics uh, with these kind of distances as well. I don't want to claim that it's going to replace sort of the more careful alignment-based phylogenetics. It's not going to be as accurate as that, but it gives you something much better than what you would get with one marking gene. Uh, okay, so if you think about the pipeline, you know, once we have this uh, query distances to the references, why don't we think about phylogenetic placement? So let's assume that in addition to your reference uh, genome skins, you also have a tree. However, you computed them. Maybe you computed the tree from these genome skins. Maybe there is a gold standard that you found in a paper. You know, uh, let's say you have a sort of reference phylogeny. Can we now do phylogenetic placement using distances? Can we take these distances and figure out where in the phylogeny this query should, uh, uh, should be added to. And then this is called the phylogenetic placement problem. We developed a method called APPLES for this specific uh, 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 purpose. Before I show its results, why do we even need phylogenetic placement? This is really, the, why can't we just always pick the closest match to a reference database? This is the reason, you know, this is what a lot of you would know as Felsenstein zone trees if these branch distances are specific branches. These are what always make things difficult in, in evolutionary biology, right? So, so let's say this is your query. This, if you look at this tree, the most similar uh, genomes to it is going to be this, this genome B. Uh, but phylogenetically, that's not most close uh, species. Like it's not in that same group, right? It has a more, it has a common ancestor with C before it has a common ancestor with B. So this is the right place to classify this, this genome scan, but the closest match will put it there. So we looked at some uh, you know, simulated data that we had lying around that is up to 200,000 uh, uh, leaves in the tree. And we asked if we just remove each leaf and add it to the closest um, sort of sister, what percentage of, uh, it's a like closest match, what percentage of time, as sister to its closest match, what percentage of time do we find the right placement? And it's somewhere between 50 to maybe 65%, depending on um, you know, how, how dense your sampling is. So this is dense sampling. As you go to the left, we have randomly subsampled those three. So taxon sampling helps, but it's still at 65%. If you do maximum likelihood placement using uh, P placer or EPANG, your accuracy is much better. But you can't do that with more than 1,000 or more, maybe 5,000 species in your backbone. It, it just that the tools don't work beyond that uh, level. And what we developed apples is uh, a distance-based placement method. It's linear time is super fast. We will see it today. And it can easily go to 200, a backbone of a 200,000 species. And, um, and it can sort of benefit from a, uh, uh, more taxon sampling. Its accuracy is not as high as P placer when, when they can both run, but of course it can have denser samples. Um, okay, so the way apples works is basically, I'm not gonna go through the details, it's based on least squared error. Uh, um, you know, the details of how it works, uh, let's, let's skip over it. 
The only important thing, uh, and this is the paper, you can read it. The only impor important thing is that it can work with or the without alignments, right? So you can run uh, apples to do phase placements using distances computed from a schema without ever having assembled or aligned uh, genomes. Um, we tested this, uh, this thing where you have, when you compute distances using a schema and then you place it using Apple uh, on three uh, data sets of uh, genome schemes. And we compared it with, with just choosing the closest match. And we saw that uh, you know, this method works better. You, you find the correct placement um, uh, much more often uh, if, you, if you use this approach. Um, OK. So, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's apples. The, uh, there is this filtering step that I said I'm not going to talk about much. I'll just say that there is this tool, Kraken, that you can try to use for basically trying to match each of your reads to a reference library of, um, of bacteria. We did an analysis uh, that was published in uh, uh, 2019 to see how good this method is. On the x-axis, what you have here is the distance between your contaminant and the closest species in a reference library. And what we saw is that if in your reference library you have a, uh, uh, you have a, you have a match that is, let's say, 5% or lower to your contaminant, you, get pretty, you can find these contaminants pretty well. But if you don't have a closed match, the method doesn't work. It, it's not a big surprise, but um, you know, 5% is not much, right? And at 5 to 10%, you're already missing a lot of contaminants. Um, so I, I'm going to skip through all these results. The, the bottom line is that Kraken is uh, is going to improve. So this is you know this is results for you know comparing genome schemes with or without filtering with Kraken. After filtering, you get improved results, uh, but it doesn't remove all the bad effects of contaminants. So this is a place where more um, uh, development is needed. I have one last uh, topic to quickly uh, finish here. And it's, uh, it's a question you might all have. What if my sample has more than one species in it? What if it's two or 10? If it's 10, I don't have a good answer yet. But if it's only two, we have developed a method that basically you take your mixed sample, you get a bag of reads that is mixed, you compute its distances to all your reference, and then we can sort of take these distances and deconvolute it to two sets of distances. So if you didn't have our method, what you could do is just match um, your mixed sample to the top two closest uh, uh, species in your reference set if you knew it's a mixture of two things. And it worked, uh, it would, would work perfectly well in, in, in our simulations if you had the the constituents present in your sample. When you don't have the constituents present in your sample, like, like over here and, and here, oftentimes it doesn't work well. And apples, which, which, all, which I talked about earlier, would also not work because it can only place on, on one branch, right? So, so existing methods would, would not work. But what we did was we developed this method called MISA. And what, what it, it does is basically it, it places your sample on two branches instead of one branch. If we have time during the tutorials, we'll see how it works. So it take your mixed samples, it gives you two places on the phylogeny where it thinks the, the, uh, the sample should belong. And, and it works uh, quite well. Even when both of the uh, constituents are missing from your phylogeny, it can find you know, where those constituents should have been. Um, uh, and and as, a, as a bonus, it can also be used to detect the origin, the origin of a recent hybrid. So these are various recent hybrid, uh, recent yeast hybrids. Um, this is a uh, sort of the phylogeny of those yeast um, that they, you know, they are hybrids of two of these. And, and MISA could detect their origins in, in every single case if they were in the database and five out of six times if, if they were missing in the database.
So, so this is also a, a promising avenue. It's right now it's limited to only two species. We are hoping that we can we can uh, extend it further later. Uh, the software is available. The paper you can find it here. I'm out of time, so I'm going to just end on my um, acknowledgement paper. These are all the people who have uh, contributed and the funding from NSF. Thank you. All right, thank you, Siavash. Um, so I think we'll take a two minute break, right, Erica? Yes, two minutes, and then we will come back. Um, I think the tutorial is at the link that I put in the chat box. Yes. yes. Is there anything else that the participants need? No, there is in the, in the beginning of the tutorial, let me share my uh, screen. At the beginning of the tutorial, there is a bunch of like downloads. If you want to go, uh, you can go ahead and start on those downloads. If you just look at this place, there are a bunch of downloads. These are pretty fast. There are a couple of more over here that are a little bit the store. So, we want you can uh, let this start before before you move. All right, we can get started. Um, as always, let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to be monitoring the group chat. Yes, please do, because I know I talked very fast on about three different tools, so it could have been confusing despite um, warnings from, uh, from Chris that we should take this, though I, I went ahead and went very fast. So I apologize for that, but do, do ask questions. So, so what, what we are going to try to accomplish during the tutorial the tutorial is available here. You can go over it at your own pace later if you couldn't follow all the steps. Uh, the, the, true, the three tools that I talked about were a Skimmer, Apples, and Mesa. So a Skimmer, just to refresh your uh, memory right now, the input is to genomes or genome skims, and it computes the distance between them. Uh, Apples uh, adds a um, adds a query to a backbone phylogeny using distances, whether uh, alignment based or alignment free, and MISA adds a mixture sample of um, two genomes onto a uh, onto two places in the backbone uh, phylogeny. And as part of this tutorial, I'm going to use also these other four tools. Um, I have the details for installation uh, below. The papers that you want to look at are also given here. The installations that I'm going to go through are all done on Mac OS uh, Catalina. Um, for Lin like everything should basically, if you are on Linux, 
Uh, I'm sure that all the steps have an alternative. In the comments, I have tried to put in the, uh, the name of the alternative files you need, you need for Linux. For Windows as well, I think they have uh, alternatives, all of the steps. Uh, the three main tools are in Python, so they should work in everywhere. These, these tools are not in Python, these, other, these other tools, they, you, know, you might have a little bit more difficulty with those. If you couldn't follow some of the steps, uh, uh, a lot of the files that will be produced as part of this tutorial are made available as, uh, as part of the zip file. So you can just download it and, and have it be handy. Um, you know, if you couldn't follow a step, just, just copy the corresponding directory and go to the next, um, next steps until, uh, until you figure out a, um, uh, a solution. Uh, Metina and myself will, will try to answer questions on the, on the chat. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's start. Unless there is any question, I can go ahead and start. I'm going to just make a directory somewhere for keeping all the files that I'm going to create here. Uh, like many other people, I'm going to uh, prefer to use Conda to have a fresh um, uh, environment so that I'm sure uh, there is no um, uh, there, there is no interference between uh, various things. Uh, I'm going to have um, uh, two windows open so that sometimes we can do two things at, uh, at the same time uh, while we are waiting for something to finish. So some of these uh, take a little bit of time. So while this conda is creating or, or environment here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually what did this uh, finish? So I don't, I'm, I'm gonna just keep going here. It was faster than I thought. So we are just gonna go ahead and activate this environment. Uh, for those of you who uh, um, uh, who, who don't uh, uh, know um, Conda is basically a way to create um, a virtual environment where you know each time you create an environment and you activate it like I did, it's like a fresh start, so that your you know the softwares that you install are not going to sort of um, uh, set, uh, uh, yeah, step on each other's food, uh, feet compared to your previous downloads, right? Okay, so uh, next thing we want to do is, if you haven't done it before, you want to add Bioconda to, Bioconda is a place where a lot of um, your Conda tools can be found and installed. Uh, I already had it, so they just said it's already in there, but if you don't have it, it's just going to just add it. Once you have this Bioconda, now we can easily find, uh, install all the tools that, all the three tools that I, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, talk about. They're very easy to install. You just write Conda install a skimmer. Uh, it's going to uh, find it on this Bioconda channel and it's going to install it. Again, this might take uh, a minute or so. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to start downloading. So there is uh, most of the data we are going to uh, uh, download that is small. There is one of them that is large, this one. So I'm going to start that uh, download right away in my second window. So it's in the same directory, it's a second window. I'm going to just start it. It's not super large, but it's like a couple of hundred, um, uh, hundreds of megabytes. Uh, on my machine, it takes a little bit of time because my internet is not super fast. Um, okay, so, so this, is, you know, this is happening right now. And we are also installing a skimmer at the same time. Uh, both of them uh, should uh, finish uh, soon. Okay, so the installation of a skimmer finished. Whenever I install a software, I just like to run its help command just to make sure it's, uh, it's installed correctly. Uh, and the first time uh, you install, the first time you run any of these softwares in Python, it's gonna sort of compile them. Uh, and so the first time is gonna take a long time. It's starting from the second time, it's gonna be uh, fast. So this is right now sort of compiling all these tools that was uh, installed uh, at the same time. Uh, or big file here, actually it was a couple of hundred, it was only 78 megabases uh, is, is, is downloaded. 
So let me tell you what's inside this, uh, uh, this, this large file. I'm going to go ahead and unzip it. It's, it's an archive, so this, this is the command you're gonna use to, to unzip it. This would work in Windows, in uh, Linux and uh, Mac. In Windows, I'm sure there's, there's some way of un, uh, you know, uh, unzipping this file. I'm not sure what that way is, but I'm sure you would know. Okay, so when you unzip it, you see, so there's a bunch of genomes here. These are, these are basically assemblies of various uh, yeast uh, species. Uh, I think in this file we have about uh, 20 or so uh, uh, various species. Um, we have just uh, you know, zipped all their genomes and we're gonna use that uh, in the tutorial. Okay, so while that's, uh, okay, so that, 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 that finished uh, unzipping, right? So let's go back to our installation. Uh, a skimmer help work. We, have, we can see the help, so we know that the installation worked. Let's now go ahead and install uh, Apples. Um, if you haven't installed Apples before, because I know I asked you guys to do that, uh, we made some important changes just last night. Uh, so please run this uh, instruction to see which version you have. This is how you can tell what version of apples you have. We have to, we have to improve that and we have to design a better way. But for now, this is, this is how you tell which version you have. I have version 1.3.0. If you have 1.2 point something, um, it will work fine only if you have Python 3.6 or 3.7. It will not work with Python 3.8. Uh, so for Python 3.8, we had to fix a bunch of things, and those fixes are in this version of Apple. Um, so if you have one of those uh, old versions, you can just run this instruction right here. Maybe I should make this a little bit larger as well. You can write, uh, run this instruction over here to be able to uh, 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 to, to uh, update. Uh, to the new version. Okay, so I'm gonna also install Minsa and then stop, take a breath, and see if anyone has a question. People are, are, are very uh, silent, so I'm guessing I'm going too fast. Okay, so um, installing Misa is very similar. You just go, Python, you could just do pip. I like to do python-mpip, it's the same thing. Uh, install Misa. I'm just gonna install it. Not gonna take any time, it's very fast. And then you run this. And, uh, and you can see all the help. Okay, so we're done with installing the main tools that, uh, that we're gonna uh, use. Uh, let me just see if people have any questions. I don't see any question. Is, is anyone following? Is anyone having any questions? Yeah, let me, uh, maybe I'll give people a minute to go through some of these steps. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Izumi, you can just place it in this uh, directory called tutorial that we created. If you download it, just just in this, uh, just place it there and uh, and unzip it there. So inside the file, there should be a folder. Like once you unzip it, there should be a folder called genomes. And that we are going to assume that folder called genomes is within this folder called tutorial. So you're going to have tutorial within it, you're going to have genomes. Oh, and then there is another file called gold.tree, which is our um, sort of golden phylogeny. Golden, as in what we think is probably correct.
Okay, so um, I'll keep going. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Don't don't hesitate to interrupt me. I have a tendency to go fast if I'm not interrupted. If there was it, another question that just popped up. I've installed the skimmer, apples, and Misa before. Should I consider them in? Should I consolidate them in this tutorial for them? No, no, it doesn't matter. If you have installed the software tools, it doesn't matter where they are. So when you install tools with PIP or Conda, either one, they are not installing them in a specific directory. They install them um, sort of on your machine so you can, um, you can access them from anywhere. It doesn't matter where, uh, where they are. Um, uh, the only thing that needs to be in this directory are these other tools that we are going to look at right now. If you have installed apples before, please go ahead and use this command. Uh, before, as in before last night, please go ahead and uh, use this, com or I guess yesterday evening, go ahead and use this command to, to update it to the latest version. You might, you might not need it, but, but it doesn't uh, hurt. Okay, so the other four tools that we are, we are, we, I'm going to, uh, install are not the main tools for um, in our tutorial, but we are going to use them in, in various steps. Fast ME to create uh, trees from um, from distances. Fast tree. Uh, this this is going to be one of the most like, important points. I'll, I'll I'll keep talking about it. When we use apples, we need to reestimate branch lengths of the reference tree using the same model used for uh, inferring the distances. And we are going to use FAST3 to accomplish that step. We'll see that, that step uh, uh, over and over. It's very important. Uh, there's this uh, package called Guppy. Uh, I couldn't find a version of it that is um, on their own website that is uh, uh, compatible with the latest Mac. Like Peter was saying, Mac is trying to drive everyone crazy. Catalina doesn't work with a bunch of things that had been compiled before. So, but I did have lying around on my own GitHub some version of copy that, that does work. So, so I'm, I'm asking you to download that one. I have a Linux version, I have a Mac version. You download whichever is, is relevant. I unfortunately don't have a Windows version. So this is the only thing that you can't do on Windows. But what Guppy does is, so when you do fudging placement, the standard output is in this format called gplace. Uh, G, uh, I hope you can hear me. gplace um, is, a, um, is a format that not every visualization tool will understand. Guppy can translate that format to other formats. There are, um, there are other alternatives to Guppy that have come out recently. Um, I'm struggling to remember the name. Uh, it's from um, it's, uh, uh, Alexis, uh, yes, Gappa. Um, that, 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 you can use that tool if you couldn't get Guppy. I just, uh, I have used Guppy a lot, so for me it's easier to use. Also some of the online uh, tree visualization tools like um, Interactive Tree of Life do understand JPLAY. So if you don't have this, don't, don't worry, you can just use online tree reviewing software. Finally, we're gonna do ART. ART is for simulating a genome scheme given a, um, given a uh, genome. You're gonna simulate genome schemes instead of using real genome schemes. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, walk, like, I'm going to just uh, uh, execute these, these commands to install FastME. Okay, so FastME executed, this means it's for Mac. When you install it, it, it uh, installs it for all the, uh, you know, it has Windows, it has Linux, it has Linux 32. So, so, so you're fine. Uh, whatever you have, it's going to have. I'm going to use the OS X one. If you are on one of these other machines, just use the version that is relevant. Um, okay, let's do fast trees. Fast tree, I'm not so sure if you can um, install it on Windows using this commands, but on their website, if you go on fast tree website, I have a link to it uh, on top. I think they do have a binary for Windows from what I remember. Okay, so let's see. Fast tree is compiled. 
you run the help and you can see that you know it's, it's compiled correctly let's get the guppy tool that i was just describing as fast enough and we can make sure that it works there we go it's working it's telling us what version it has this is an old version but i described to you why we need an old version and let's do art so art what it does is you give it a genome it uh, simulates a um, next generation sequencing run for you. It adds what, whatever level of coverage you want. It adds sequencing error. Uh, the one that we're going to use is this tool called Art Illumina. Um, uh, so the, the, the file I downloaded is for Mac. The one for Linux is, is referenced here. If you go on this website, I think they have a version for Windows as well. Um, uh, this this is going to simulate uh, new Illumina uh, reads for us. Okay, and and the last setup we need before we get to the more interesting stuff is getting the data set. We have already uh, downloaded the data set, right? I did that in this other window, right? We we already unzipped it. Um, I'm just going to do this to to show you these genomes are all roughly 13, 10 to 13 megabytes in size, right? So these are not super large genomes, these are yeast genomes. And we can just look at one of them, top of one of them to just make sure everything is correct. At the very sort of high level, yes, that looks like a, you know, it's just like a config in, in some assembled genome. Okay, so we are done with setup. Let me, let me stop one more time, give people a couple of minutes to maybe uh, catch up a minute or two to catch up and ask questions if, if there are any and then we'll start uh, going through the actual uh, steps how's everybody doing I think I've managed to put everyone uh, in the sleep Did we get the software installed? Do we need more time? What do we think? Someone should give us some feedback. It sounds like people are still installing packages. Okay, so maybe I'll wait for another minute or two. So there's a question in the chat. Was it Python run Apple? Uh, no, you can just do run Apple slash edge. You don't necessarily need Python. Not in, uh, not in Linux or Mac. Um, I'm a little bit less sure about how it works in Windows, but um, if anyone uses Python often in Windows, maybe can help. But in, in, in Linux or, um, 
or Mac, you don't need it. You just, oh, oops. Um, you just run, uh, run apples like this and it should work. It should give you the help. You have installed it using Flip. Maybe you guys can use the uh, participant list to give us a thumbs up if you were able to get the software installed. I feel like this is a very shy group. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly because people don't know each other. Uh, so I assume you might have had a conda if you had it if you did the installation using conda um, and you close your windows you you have to run this instruction again the one I'm pointing at right now to re uh, activate your environment so if you did this yesterday you close the window and you open it again you have to run this command again so that your conda goes back to um, um, like to go back to the same conda environment as before. Okay, so what do you guys think of um, going ahead? Um, yeah, this is going to be recorded, so I'll, I'll share it. If people cannot follow everything right now, they can maybe follow later. I think that's a good idea. We've got half an hour left. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so let's just start with the first step. The first step is we're going to run a skimmer on our set of genomes. So in initial, so yeah, you can run a skimmer on genome schemes or full genome. Let's just start with uh, uh, full genomes. Now, what we are going to need is a folder. I'm going to call this folder non-hybrids because remember I told you some of these yeast uh, genomes are actually hybrids. I don't want to start working on those yet. I created a folder called non-hybrid. And the way a schema works is that it needs, a, as input, it needs a folder which a bunch of genomes or genome schemes, whichever they are, so either FAQ files, uh, PASQ files, or FNA files, PASTA files, with, uh, with your genomes or genome schemes, or a mix of two. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can uh, work with both. So I'm going to run this analysis, this, this line here. What this does is it basically just copies my genomes from uh, this genomes directory into this nine hybrid uh, directory. There is a file called nine non hybrids.txt. It gives the name of the genomes that we know are, or we think we know they are, uh, are not hybrids. Uh, these are the ones. Um, I'm, I'm actually looking at uh, only uh, like a subset of them um, so that things go faster. So we are going to just copy this, this for loop right there. It's going to just copy, uh, copy the genome. So now if I look inside this non-hybrids uh, directory, I have a file, uh, the assembly file for each of the genomes. Now what I want to do, so we have eight genomes. I want to do phylogenetic placement, right, uh, eventually. So I'm going to uh, create another folder called query, non-hybrids query. And I just uh, chose one of them, uh, Cervasis uh, or Cervasii. 
And I'm going to move that to this query folder. So this is going to be my query uh, genome. And the other seven are going to be my reference ones. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, do this uh, so that you know what's going on, right? So you have seven genomes in non-hybrids right now, and you have one genome in this query folder. Okay, so having set up everything, now we are ready to run a skimmer. So you run a skimmer using this command. So I'm going to go ahead and start it and tell you in the meantime what, what this is doing because it's going to take like four to five minutes to run. So this command is basically uh, telling the, ref, uh, the skimmer that we are trying to create a reference package of several genomes. Or reference package is going to be seven genomes in this case. Uh, those reference uh, genomes can be found in this folder. It's going to estimate its cover, uh, their coverage and sequencing error and length and things like that. It has already finished that step. In the meantime, it's going, uh, once, it's doing, once it's done with that, it's going to do the sketching that I talked about for computing the Jacquard uh, index, right? Remember, there were two steps, coverage and the sketching. Right now, it's working on the sketching. Coverage is fast. The sketching is going to take some time. It's using all the CPUs on my machine, so hopefully you can still hear me. Let me know uh, if I'm breaking up. Um, so we can start looking at what uh, it's outputting already. It's creating this folder called library. Um, and inside that library file, it's going to create a folder for each of the genomes that were in our input uh, folder. Inside each of those folders, it's going to have this, uh, this file called some, uh, you know, the name of your genome dot that. If you look at it, uh, it's going to give you um, uh, its, uh, its estimates of coverage, genome length, error rate, and read length. Now, in this example, you see that coverage, error rate, and read length are, error rate is zero, read length and coverage are not applicable. Why? Because we are working on assemblies here, not on uh, genome schemes. When we work on genome scheme uh, later, we will see that these will be filled out. So that's one of the files that it creates. The other is this file called MSH. This is your sketch of the genome. This is, you know, a representation of the bag of reads. Um, and uh, I don't think we can look at it. It's just like a binary file that doesn't have any meaning. Okay, so a skimmer has finished this job. So this library uh, has been created, right? We have created or referenced library. Now what we want to do, oh, in addition to the reference library, it also creates for us this file ref this mate, uh, ref this map. So this means reference distance matrix dot text. So let me look at that. Um, so it's just a text file, nothing fancy. It's a, uh, I think a tab delimited file. Is it tabs? Yes, it's the tab delimited file. Uh, in, uh, in rows, you have the species. On columns, you have a species. Each element is the distance between the two, right? So uh, it's, just like a, it's just like a CSV file with, with tabs, right? So it gives you the distance between every pair of a species. So between this uh, species and that species, the distance is 16%, right? You get the distance between all pairs of your reference genomes. Okay, so what we want to do next is to use this, this, these distances to get a backbone tree, a, a reference tree for a reference library. Now, there are two ways you can do this. One is if you don't have a reference phylogeny that you trust, you can just use this distance matrix that I was just showing to create one for yourself using distance-based phylogenetics. The only thing you are going to need is a little script that I'm going to download here. This is script, TSV to PHI math, is going to um, convert 
this uh, this uh, TSV file that we were just looking at into a format that FastME would recognize. Um, so it's a very simple thing. You download it, you just run it, it, it does the, uh, the conversion. Uh, the files are actually quite similar in format. They're not super different. You need this, like you need to say on top, you know, what's the size. That's, that's, that's really the main difference and you don't need to have the names of the species on top. The differences are small. You can even change these files yourself manually if you want. Okay, so now that we have this file that FastME is going to recognize, we are going to go ahead and run FastME to get a phylogeny. Now this took no time, right? This is a distance-based method and we have a small tree in like zero seconds, it's going to give you a, uh, a phylogeny that it estimated. You give it that distance matrix, it gives you a tree, right? And there's uh, not much else to it. So you can look at this tree with whatever tool you like. Um, I, my default is to use big tree, but you can use, you know, whatever, right? And uh, when I'm working on command line, as so in Fig Tree, you can look at this tree. Uh, on uh, in command line, I like to use this tool called Newric uh, Utilities. If you are comfortable with command line, I very much uh, recommend it. It's a very nice tool. You can just give, you know, run this, and you can look at the tree and have an understanding of how it looks like. Now. Um, I also happen to have a tree here called uh, gold then tree or gold tree, gold tree. This is a tree that we found from a prior publication. They had done sort of careful phylogenetics, not this distance-based stuff, and they had come up with this tree. And uh, if you look at them, you can convince them that, like, you convince yourself that the two trees are identical. Uh, except, of course, the cervases is missing from this one because we removed it, right? We don't have cervases, but everything else is, is, is identical. Now, what if you didn't want to do distance space analysis? What if you wanted to use your golden tree? So what I'm going, I'm going to run this command right here. This is going to create this tree called backbone tree, which is our golden tree. Um, uh, limited only to this uh, species that we have here in our backbone, in our reference uh, phylogeny. If you do that, you will still have to, this is very, very important, you still have to compute branch lengths. And the computation of branch lengths, oh, oh, there you go. You can do it if you have, uh, if you have distance, uh, uh, if you have alignment-free uh, distances, you can do it with uh, fast ME. So this is the uh, instruction I'm going to run. I'm going to give it my distance matrix. I'm going to give it the output file name and I'm going to give it as input uh, uh, this file. Okay, so I have a, I, here. I should have given it this file. And it's going to create for me a backbone. Uh, it's going to add branch lenses to the backbone tree. So now I can look at this file that it outputs and it's going to have branch lengths on, the, uh, on this, uh, unlike the original file. Okay, so there is one important point that I um, did not mention, so let me mention that. When we ran a skimmer earlier on, we ran it like this. What does this dash T mean? What is dash T? So let's run the help of a skimmer and hopefully it'll tell us what dash T means. Apply juice scatter transformation to distances. If you run a skimmer without dash t, it's going to produce distance, uh, Hamming distances. It's going to output Hamming distances. If you run dash t, it's going to also do the juice scatter transformation of Hamming distances to phylogenetic distances. It's a very simple transformation. It's going to do that for you. So why is this important? Well. When I, so my distance matrix that I got from a skimmer is based on the Juke Scanter model. And, um, uh, 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 and, and, uh, uh, and so that's important. You can't do phylogenetics directly using Hamming distances and thus um, your Hamming distances are very small. Um, 
Okay, so so now this tree that we have with uh, with branch lenses, it's really with a Juke Scanter uh, model. Okay, we have everything we need for the backbone tree. We have our backbone tree. We have uh, now we want to do the actual placement. Now to do the actual placement, we are going to first run a schema like this so what is this so let me start running it and then i'll tell you what this is doing this uh, instruction is again dash t is for juice canter previously we were running a schema with reference it was creating a reference library now we are running it with query we just give it our query file in this case it's just one file and uh, and we give it the library what is library library is uh, that library that we created before using the reference so what this command just uh, did was it took this query and it computed it this its distance versus every species in the library so i can look at the so the file that was created as a result is this file distance the name of your query species that text so let's look at that. So um, this is your query species right here. And it's distance, juke scanter distance to each of your reference uh, species is given to you here. So you can just visually see the closest thing in this case is uh, paradoxus, right? Um, and uh, as it happens in this case, that's the correct placement. We will see that in a, in a second. But, um, but that's not, of course, always true. That's why you need values of placement. Okay, so, so we have the distances of the query to everything in the reference. Now we have another one of these, oh, this is not the right format. So this file, this format file is not what we can give to Apple as input. We have to tra um, translate the format. The format translation, again, has a very uh, small script that we are going to download here. Oops. Okay, so let me do this one more time. Okay, so we downloaded this tool called convert to TSV. We are going to convert the file that we were just looking at to this TSV file format that we are going to be able to use. Um, wait, uh, let me just make sure that uh, that works. Yes, so now that it's just the same distance as provided in a different format. It just changed. Uh, the, the the format of the file instead of columns it has instead of two columns and many rows it has two rows and many columns so it's the kind of thing that um yeah you always have to do in bioinformatics and it's annoying but but we are you know we have uh, no other uh, way we have to convert things back and forth all the time okay so now we have all the inputs we need for running apples in the right format so i'm going to just run it Okay, so for some reason, my, uh, oops. okay, there you go. Um, okay, so this is the command that I ran and it, as you can see, it finished in no time. So if you're running apples, you're giving it the backbone tree that we inferred using fast and me. You're giving it this distance matrices that we computed using a skimmer and then just change the format. And you're, you're giving it an output file now. The output is a jplace file. You can go ahead and look at it. It's, uh, it basically gives you the tree and it tells you where on that tree it should go. Now, a lot of us can't read that and understand what it means. So what we wanna do is turn that into something we can look at. So this guppy command is gonna do that for us. So it's gonna take this jplace file as input. Remember guppy was the tool that we installed in the beginning. It's going to take this jplace file and it's going to create this uh, 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 tree file. The tree file is a new wig file, right? I can just look at it. It's a new wig file. So now I have something I can look at, right? So I'm going to just display this file um, here on my uh, uh, console. Uh, what we can see is that the query is added to the, so let me also draw the backbone tree, backbone fast and E3. Uh, maybe I'll make this bigger and you can see both. 
Um, and then you should make it smaller so that you can see both. Let's see. Yeah, I think they are both more or less uh, fitting. So this is your backbone tree. It didn't have uh, services in it. It's now added to the correct place as sister to paradoxes. Um, so this is sort of a full example. Everything uh, starting from uh, you know genomes. We remove one of them. We added them back to a tree that now includes all the species. Let me show you one little cool feature here as well that I hadn't mentioned there. When you run talk, you can run it with dash dash XML. Instead of a new week file, it's going to create an XML file. This XML file, you can, uh, you, can, uh, 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 you can look at it using uh, various tools. Uh, including uh, this forest there, or, uh, you know, uh, why is it not fine? Okay, um, I'll, I'll figure this out. There, the, the, this file, if you open it, it'll, it'll, uh, in the right tool, it will show you like the placement results and uh, in, uh, in 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 a color, right? Instead, so you can easily see what of which things are are placed. For some reason, I there's a little point with right now. Okay, so uh, so that was with real genomes. Let's now do it with genome skins, right? So this this these little three commands I have here, they are going to create a folder for skins. Uh, just like we had for the, for the genomes. And then they are going to take each of the full genomes that we have, and they're going to run art on them. Uh, so the details of this syntax doesn't matter. It's basically like just run art on each of the full genomes. Uh, we have set the read length here to 100. We have set the coverage to two. We could have used any other uh, setting. So this is now simulating uh, genome schemes for us for all those uh, genomes. While this is working, maybe, oh, there you go. Okay, it was eventually able to find the uh, tool. Okay, there you go. So this is uh, Archaeopteryx, uh, a tool that can show those uh, XML files. There are a bunch of other ones out there. Um, so let's look at that XML file right here. Uh, if you use colorize branch, it'll tell you which of the things that, which, which things are the query, you know, the red things is the query here and everything else is your backbone tree. So it's just like a new week tree, but you can also, you know, have colors and it's a little bit nicer to look. So we have around 10 minutes left. I don't see any questions in the chat. Feel free to use the chat. Yeah, if there are questions, please go ahead and ask. Otherwise, I'll keep I'll keep uh, marching through the uh, the tutorial. We don't have to finish everything. We've already seen one example. So okay. So now that uh, we have the schemes, we are going. We we just went to this schemes directory. Inside the schemes directory, again, we have hybrids and non-hybrids. But instead of FASTA files, we have FASTQ files, right? So each of these FASTQ files is, is, is a set of reads. Uh, so we don't have genomes anymore. We have reads. In this case, with 2x coverage, you could have it with more or less. You can look at it. These are reads, right? OK, but nothing changes. From here on, all the steps are exactly the same as before. So we go ahead and run a skimmer on this uh, set of uh, skins. And now it's going to actually uh, uh, estimate coverage and sequencing error and things like that. Hopefully, it will give us good estimates of the coverage. And once we are done with that, we are going to uh, skim the query just like we did before. Um, and uh, I'm going to remove the FNA from the name of the genome. Just going to have an FNA in the name of genomes. We are going to convert the file formats. We're going to run Apple. We're going to run Guppy and look at the tree that we get from the genome scans.
So it is still is working on estimating the coverage, as you can see. Previously, this step was fast because, of course, for um, for real uh, for for genome assemblies, you know, you don't have to estimate the coverage. Now it's going to take a little bit of time, but not a whole lot. Um, okay, so maybe while this is working, we'll go and look at some of the coverages that it has uh, created. So inside this schemes directory, you again, uh, uh, Schemer is creating a library folder where for each genome, you are going to have the dat file and the, uh, and now you have a histogram file. This is the histo, the KMER histogram file from which we are estimating the coverage. So let's look at one of these files and see what we see. Oops. Okay, so it estimated the coverage for this genome to be 2.04. And we know the coverage is two, so it's off a little bit. And it's uh, uh, estimating the error rate to be uh, close, uh, less than 1%. So yeah, I forgot what's the default error level in, in, in art. It's not like 1%, it depends on where you are in the read as we saw in the morning, right? The, it's not a fixed error rate across the, across the read. But this is sort of like the average. Okay, so we can look at this for all the genomes, and um, let's uh, let's look at the, for example, coverage for all of them. And you can see that for all of them, it's estimating the coverage to be somewhere around two x. So estimates are pretty good. Um, and the, and and it also estimates for your genome length. In this case, the genome length is estimated, right? Because if you have only reads, you don't know what the genome length is. You have to estimate. Um, okay, so uh, it's, it's almost finished. It has done most of the things that it's gonna do. Uh, I still don't see any questions. So once this step finishes, which it just did, um, we are going to do. Uh, we are going to run a skimmer on the query genome scheme, which again is now a fast Q file, not a line, uh, not a assembly. Uh, we're going to do the file formatting that is needed once this is finished, and uh, and then we are going to do file gene placement, and we'll see that we get sort of identical to results to what we had from full genomes. Okay, so let's give this a minute to finish. Are there any questions? I have seven minutes uh, left. I'm hoping to also show you MISA because it's very cool. This example is gonna be very cool if we can manage to finish it. Any questions? Okay, so skimmer finished. I'm going to just run this like one after the other without the stopping because these are exactly the same as, uh, oops. I have to fix my uh, tutorial. Okay, uh, these are exactly the same as uh, steps we did before. Okay, so now we have here inside or a schemes library, a tag tree, right? So we have a tree that we generated from uh, the schemes. So I'm gonna show that tree. And we have also a uh, tree that we generated from full genomes. So I'm going to show that one as well. And, and you can see that, well, it's a little bit hard to see. Let me make this a little bit smaller. Maybe you can see that. Okay, there you go. And you can see that uh, they're almost identical with the genome schemes. The branch length is a little bit shorter here than, than what we had with the genomes. This is the tree you got from the genome. This is the tree we got from the schemes. The topology is the same, the branch lens is slightly different, right? And, and, um, and that's about it. Okay, so we are done with this uh, genome scheme analysis. I do have a still five minutes. If there are questions, I'd rather answer those. Otherwise, I'll show you mix, mixture analysis. There is a question. Um, what is the difference between new week display and gold display? There is no gold display. There was new week display. Uh, is is just a as part of the new week utility package. You can give it as input a new week tree. The new week tree that I give it as input was this tree called gold tree, which is part of that file that you downloaded in the beginning. 
this file, um, this, has a, this has the species that I'm using in my tutorial, but it also has a bunch of other ones. I removed this for this tutorial because of time. I wanted everything to go fast. Okay, so let's see if we can manage to do mixture analysis because this final result is so cool. I'm hoping to be able to show you. So I'm going to create one directory for mixture analysis. I'm going to copy this thing. So this is the yeast that makes, uh, you know, it's used in beer production, uh, Pastoronius. It's a mixture of, uh, it's, it's a known mixture of two of these species, Cervases, and I think uh, one of these two, I forgot which one. But remember, we didn't have Cervases in a reference tree. Can we still figure out where in the tree that missing constituent is? And the answer is yes. So let's do this. So we are, we are, so that's our query, right? This, this mixture, we are giving that mixture as, as query to this, uh, to this chimera. And we are computing its distances to our library of, uh, of, of, of genomes, right? So it's going to compute the distances from this mixture to every genome in, in our library. But remember, one of the uh, constituents of this mixture, or it's not a mixture, it's a hybrid. One of the sort of parents of this hybrid, Cervases, is missing from the reference library. So, so it'd be interesting to see what, where MISA is going to put it. Okay, so uh, MISA is working on it. It's, uh, it's going to take a little bit of uh, time to work. Okay, it's, it's very close to finish. Okay, it's done. We converted the file format to the correct format. It's the same script that I described before. So now what we have is this file. Uh, let me uh, show you this version of the file. It's a little bit easier to look at. So this is the distance from this hybrid genome to each of the genomes in your reference library. And interestingly enough, one, one of our, um, so Cervases is not in there, right? So it couldn't find this distance to Cervases. The sister to Cervases is Paradoxus, and it's not one of the uh, like the smallest two distances. So if you just guess these are the ancestors, you would be wrong, right? So you would make a wrong uh, prediction here. But if you were to run MISA, the tool for mixture analysis that I uh, described, this uh, tool is not going to be as fast as Apple's uh, because it's, it's, it's solving a much harder problem. It's trying to decouple those distances to two vectors of distances and do phylogenetic placement at the same time. So it has to go through many iterations uh, of looking at various possibilities for the deconvolution and for the placement. So this is what all these logs are. It's doing its thing, is trying to find where is the best two places where you could put this hybrid genome? Uh, it's not going to take that much time. In, in a couple of, uh, in a minute or so, it should, it should finish. And then, oh, there you go. It's finished. Um, so, um, not, so it took about a minute or two minutes. Um, oh, wait, no, no. This is the running time just for one iteration. Never mind. Uh, so now what we are going to do is we are going to look at the, uh, so we just do the copy to replace J place with the, with the, with the correct thing. There's so a now, question. Why is SRVCA reference lost? Uh, we, so the, we, we excluded it uh, on purpose. Uh, Cervasia was never part of a reference library. It was a query. So, so what we are trying to say here is, uh, let me show you. Um, mix output called the tree. So this is the fantastic thing, right? Remember Cervasius was here. This species, uh, Pastoronius, uh, is a mixture of two species. Uh, uh, you, sorry, I am butchering all these names. Eubionus and, uh, and Cervasius. Eubionus is, is can easily find, right? It's saying that one of my constituents is this species and you can look at the branch length and it's very little, right? This is basically how much evolution has happened since that mixture. It's very little. 
But the other constituent, because it wasn't in the reference library, we excluded it on purpose to see if MISA can figure it out. If, it's, if your constituents are in the mixture, it's easy to detect them. The, the beauty of MISA is that it can detect the correct placement even though you don't have the reference in there, right? So if you had services, we saw services previously would have, would have fallen right here, right? Even though we didn't have services here, we have a hybrid of services and this other thing it is, is placing, one of the two places is, is placing uh, Pastoronius is where services would have fallen. And, and, and this is really the power of MISA. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a really new tool. It was published like this month. It can right now only do a mixture of two. Hopefully in future we'll make it, uh, you know, we are still working on improving it further. Okay, uh, so the answer to your question was, it wasn't, it, we, we excluded it on purpose just to test the tool. I have a bunch of things here that I'm not going to go through. So what these do are they're going to uh, show you how to run apples if you have aligned sequences, right? So you can use apple with the skimming data, but you can also use it with normal sort of aligned genes. And these are like two examples, one on simulated data, one on real data, where we place, uh, where we place uh, on a super large tree of you know, tens of thousands of species in a matter of seconds. Um, it's an interesting example, but, but I don't want to take your time even more than I have. So I'm, I'm going to stop here. All right. Thank you, Siavash. Any questions? So everybody should have access to the slides and the tutorial, right? Yes, the slides and tutorial are out there. I'll see if I can also upload the video somewhere. All right, sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.